Yeah, I'm Dean Hevel. I'm the university's dean of students. I'm also a faculty member in architecture and uh, closet engineer. So what can I tell you? Um, today, we've seen a lot of really wonderful things, lots of great ideas, and lots of hard acts to follow. And I want to share with you one of the things that I've been working on. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but it's probably going to be true for you as it was, has been for me. My life has been a life of projects, both as an architect and now as a dean of students. You know, you come up with ideas. I mean, architects and engineers do share something in common, namely that we tend to bring ideas into the world, right? You have an idea, something which you hope and trust will be a good one, one that will benefit those of us who inhabit the world these days. And uh, you seek to make it real. You concretize it. And for an architect, it's buildings. For several engineers, it's a building. For software architects, of course, it's code. But um, what I'd like to talk today with you about is student mental health. And I'd like to begin by um, having a moment of, silence, moment of silence for three students who died in almost as many weeks, senselessly, unnecessarily, and tragically, in my view. So if you will, just a few moments, please. Thank you. So, we live in a community that celebrates the life of the mind. In order to be successful in this enterprise, we must attend to the health of the mind. We're focusing on the mental health of students here, but really, we need to attend to the mental health of our entire Cornell community. Um, good mental and physical health is the foundation upon which an excellent college education is built. And um, today, after several decades of research in the cognitive sciences, we realize that there's an awful lot we can do to improve the mental health of our student population, staff, and faculty as well. Over the last decade, or even 20 years, the climate around mental health has changed for the better. You know, there are new medications that make it possible for individuals who present with mental illness in high school to come on to college, and uh, likewise for students who present with mental health problems in college to thrive, graduate, and want to productive lives. So the project that I'm about to tell you about is, is, has that goal in mind. Uh, so what are the kinds of mental illnesses that students present with? There are many and in all kinds of variations and acuity. Um, perhaps all of you would know that uh, young people in their teens and 20s are uh, candidates where these kinds of illnesses first present themselves. And so, as it turns out, the university is a place where many students will um, begin to feel the effects of a mental illness of one sort or another. The range is enormous. You know, on the one hand, you have um, bipolar disorder. You have schizophrenia, which is a delusional illness. You have all kinds of anxiety disorders. You have eating disorders. You have obsessive compulsive disorders. And you have the common cold of mental illness, depression. And it's true that 20% of college age students will present with a diagnosable mental illness during this period. The good news is a lot of that is transient and relatively mild and, and eminently treatable. However, some of it is chronic and will have to be treated with medications and, and various therapies for the rest of one's life. So the good news, though, is that uh, there's hope for people, even with very serious mental illness, to go on to have normal and productive lives. As you perhaps know, in the past, there's been enormous stigma associated with mental illness. And um, people who present with these illnesses oftentimes find themselves isolated, shunned by their families, or the whole fact of their being ill is hidden. And um, we know now, of course, that the illnesses of the brain are just that. They're medical illnesses of an organ of the body, just like if you had an illness of your stomach or your kidney or your heart. 
And so um, we need to see it that in that way. We need to really medicalize these illnesses so that uh, they can be uh, viewed and treated in the same way as the physical illnesses that afflict us in our lives. Um, with this lessened stigma, many celebrities have begun to come out and really advocate and to talk about the mental illness. So you have people like Carrie Fisher, aka Princess Leia, who has talked at length and written about her bipolar illness. Jane Pauley, bipolar as well. Beach Boy genius Brian Wilson also has spoken about his illnesses. And the list is really quite long now that um, people realize how important it is to bring these things out into the open. There, so there seems to be a growing national commitment to uh, addressing these disabilities even before high school. And uh, so you see uh, lots of efforts taken, undertaken early on to, to mitigate these illnesses. And you even have junior colleges which are now uh, admitting students who until previously wouldn't have been admitted, you know, people who have autism or people who suffer from Down syndrome. So there is a uh, great hope that uh, societally we'll be treating these in a very different fashion very soon. Suffice to say that we now recognize the ubiquity of these illnesses and that they don't afflict one cohort of the population more or less than the other. They really are equal opportunity illnesses just like any other. And as you know, um, or perhaps you don't know, but I'll remind you if you do, if you don't, um, these illnesses oftentimes are companions of gift. So you find that many people who have achieved enormous things in research, in scholarly work, um, or in politics, or in other cultural events, cultural activity, um, have been afflicted. So you have people like Ernest Hemingway who suffered mightily from depression, as did Winston Churchill. You have people like Frederick Nietzsche, the philosopher who committed suicide in his 20s uh, as a result of mental illness. People like Einstein and Newton were thought to have had Asperger's syndrome. So um, we have to take these kinds of illnesses as ones that uh, accompany our gifts. And of course, as you know, Kuala is a place where we have an enormously diverse student population, but the one thing you all have in common is the fact that you're very talented, if not gifted, students. So um, it's my feeling that under the circumstances, uh, and the federal law, of course, mandates it, that we do not discriminate against anybody uh, who would be afflicted with these illnesses from the beginning on. So uh, we will not discriminate against a student who comes to college or goes through the admissions process because they might disclose these, uh, these situations to us in the process. We also know that um, there's an awful lot of growing up to do between the ages of 18 and 21. And um, so that we really need to think carefully about how the university now addresses student development the development of your brains. How do we manage to provide a supportive environment which uh, promotes health as well as academic achievement? So I have, and I know we're getting late, so I'm going to try to make this brief. We have created a project which is intended to do a handful of things. First of all, it's intended to create an educated community, one who can discern mental illness as it presents itself and those of our colleagues, friends, and associates, so that we can refer these individuals to get some help, get some treatment, get a diagnosis, and perhaps most importantly, learn to manage their illnesses before they graduate so they go on to have productive lives. And so we're undertaking to do this in a broad, kind of set of initiatives. What you see here is the first of a series of books that are being produced that uh, help everybody understand the nature of illness, this, these illnesses, and what they can do to support people who have them. This is the first one. It's, a, it's for the faculty. And if you're interested in having a copy, I can do two things. I can give you a hard copy here. I just have a few. 
And we actually have a low-res copy, which we can send as an attachment to an email. So if you want a copy of it for yourself, I'd be happy to send it to you as an email attachment to klh4 at cornell.edu. That's my email address. We're also doing one for the staff. It's finally being adapted uh, as we speak. We're in the process of creating one for parents and families. So the idea is that this book will do a whole host of things to connect parents to the university and establish the working relationship we expect to have with parents going forward. And of course, the watchword is partnership these days. We are in a place now where uh, parents have a totally different role than they did, say, when I was a student. When I came to school, I perhaps called my parents once or twice a semester, and it was generally for money. And they stayed out of my hair and, and expected me to, to make my way at the university. Uh, nowadays, of course, with cell phones, uh, many of you speak with your parents two or three times a day. So the kind of support that you get from parents, the kind of consultations you get from parents, is altogether different than, than it was uh, 30 years ago. So, um, that's it in a nutshell. It's an incredibly important undertaking in my view. And um, the kinds of tragic incidents that we've seen in this past year uh, are, are emblematic of our challenges. Uh, someone who takes their own life is terrible, you know, and it roils the whole community. Um, but I would also want to tell you that it really is the tip of the iceberg that there's lots and lots of other things that we need to do to support the health and wellness of our students, staff, and faculty. So I'll end there. It's my project, uh, along with the project of many others in Gannett, the Office of Student Support, and uh, we would welcome the support of those of you who might be interested. Uh, I think if we can only manage it, we'll make an enormous, enormous contribution to the welfare of our students at, at Cornell. And in addition, we will be a model for other universities, These, this type of handbook is already being adapted by Stanford, Tufts, uh, Penn, Union College, RIT. We're giving it away free to any university who wishes to adapt it to their own purposes as a, a, an InDesign file. So we hope that one day in the future, uh, universities will understand that their role is much more than creating academic programming, but rather we have an important public health responsibility. And if we take it seriously and we act on it, we'll make an enormous contribution to the national public health. Thanks.